hard to, to get people to believe that it wasn't a, a suicide attempt. Pat Young I, I was in that despair myself. that she would ever be able to resolve the difficulties in her marriage. And so she shot herself and went to hell. I knew it had to be something that would be drastic enough to put me in the hospital, but not drastic enough to kill me. So I didn't do, do my torso because I didn't want to do any serious damage. So I thought if it went in one side of my neck and out the other side, that would be bad enough to put me there. Not bad enough to keep me there. I had no idea I would die. I, w I was in a coma for three days on life support. They, they didn't, they, they were po positive I wasn't going to live. They had informed the family that um, they had lost too much blood. It started out with these little beings, um, child-sized creatures, grotesque, absolutely grotesque little creatures. And um, they took great delight in um, doing things. They would make holes in me. They would either shoot me or they would make holes by actually hitting me. And um, in these holes, they would put horrible things, Any, anything that was, that was excrement, um, vomit, um, bile, anything that was absolutely obnoxious. And these holes were everywhere. They would put them in my body, in my arm, um, in my cheek, in my eye socket. And, and you, you can't do anything. And, and you're extremely ill from it, but, but you can't get sick. I wasn't able to, to even gag. And, and you can't feel the pain, but you can feel and but then you can smell. And just beyond my right shoulder, I could hear this um, very heavy, raspy breathing, and it was getting closer. And I, I couldn't turn to see, and I didn't want to see. But I knew that as soon as it got within my range of view that what I had gone through up till, till then was absolutely nothing. It was absolute pure evil of some sort that was coming. And at the very last second, when I knew the very next instant it would be within my range of view, I opened my eyes and I was alive. Tom Harper, Rhodes Scholar, Theologian and Journalist, found when he was researching his book, Life After Death, that most people who have undergone near-death experiences claim to have at least started on the path to heaven. But there are others for whom the experience turned intensely negative. Hellish, in other words. Not long ago, my wife and I attended a church service in which the preacher declared in no uncertain terms that only those born again in Jesus would be spared eternal damnation. Afterwards, I told him I thought he had a rather narrow view of heaven and hell. I do indeed, brother, he thundered at me. I do indeed. It was obvious he felt we were headed in different directions. Maurice Rawlings, a cardiologist in Knoxville, Tennessee, has been on the front line in operating rooms where he has seen numerous people die and revive. He says we are not hearing about negative near-death experiences because no one wants to admit they've been to hell and back. Unless you're on the floor with the patient resuscitating, at the time, the heat of battle, uh, at the time of their experience, why are you fighting me off, John? What do you see? Is there fire down there? Is the devil there? What's there? Uh, then it all comes out. It's not sublimated into painless portions of the memory. You've caught them red-handed. They can't deny it. It's there. The negative experiences are always been there. They just haven't been captured because the psychologists, psychiatrists that interview these patients for a living, collecting cases of after-death experiences, haven't resuscitated one of the individuals they're reporting. How is somebody going to report a negative experience when they won't even tell their family? It's an F on the report card.
Ron Regan spent a good part of his early life stealing, extorting, and beating people up until the unlucky day he came out at the bottom end of a fight, slashed by a bottle and bleeding to death in an ambulance. And I didn't know what was happening. I thought the ambulance was on fire. And as it filled with thick black smoke, moving through the thick black cloud, almost like a, a opening in this thick blackness. And at some point I began to hear screams, multitudes of people screaming and wailing. And the best way I can describe it is it, it looked like a, a volcanic crater. And I could see like a huge lake inside this but it was blazing with fire. I never seen anything like this with the exception of a, hundreds of gallons of gasoline poured on the surface of water and ignited. But even, even worse than the, the sight, I began to, to see and to know that these voices were coming from, from those flames. And then I began to see bodies, silhouettes of human beings screaming on fire, burning, but they weren't burning up. They were in, in an inferno of flames, but they weren't burning up. And they were screaming in, in the smell. If you've ever smelled burning flesh, it, it was unbearable. And the screams were unbearable, but the most horrible thing was the pain, the emotional pain of loneliness and separation. And I saw other people, and they're saying, Ronnie, don't come here. There's no way out. Ron Reagan became a Christian minister, preaching the gospel from his own experience. Well, I have nothing against becoming a Christian minister. After all, I became one myself. But I have to admit that many researchers in the field of paranormal experience see these kinds of claims as culturally determined. We die the life we live. That the events of our own life are replayed when we die. And that our own religious beliefs and culture is mirrored back and reflected to us in the type of dying experience that we have. So it should not come as any surprise then that people who report hellish experiences are primarily, primarily fundamentalist Christians who have a deep belief in hell. To other people, the mere idea is absurd. It worries me that most ND reports are coming from the States where there is this underlying Christian belief about heaven and hell. People like author Susan Blackmore, once a parapsychologist herself, but now a debunker of myths about the afterlife. I think there may be people who have had unpleasant NDEs, frightening NDEs, who don't dare talk about it because they feel, oh, that must mean I'm a bad person. And so they're really, really frightened and live with a kind of guilt that there must be something they've done wrong. If the truth is that it's just the luck of the draw, what the situation they were in and the chemicals in their brain at the time that produced this hellish NDE, they are suffering guilt for nothing, a remorse for nothing, bad feelings for nothing. And therefore, I think the sooner we can understand these things properly, the sooner we can help people like that see that it's not their fault that they had a hellish NDE. Psychiatrist Dr. Stanislav Grof, who has spent a lifetime studying altered states, speculates that hell may in fact exist in another dimension of time and space. I see this as a real contact with the archetypal domain that has kind of independent existence, but, but uh, somehow touches upon that. If you look at um, the images of hells from different cultures, you'll see the different tortures that are being ex experienced there. You can see the nooses, and, uh, the strangling, you can see the, the pitchforks, uh, you know, the, the spits, the sharp pains, uh, people cooking in, uh, or being cooked in uh, cauldrons and so on. To experience anything sort of extreme, 
emotional and physical states. When we think about uh, heaven as it is described in spiritual scriptures, not as a, as a powerful inner archetypal experience, but as the physical heaven, then we come to such conclusions that we have disproved the existence of angels and God because we have explored systematically the astronomical heavens and we haven't seen any of those entities. Or if we know that uh, there is the heated uh, nickel and iron as the core of the earth, that there is no place for caves of Satan uh, that cannot not be hell there. So the idea is to get to hell or to heaven, uh, you change your consciousness. So somebody can be here with us and be in heaven or hell, while everybody else is in Mill Valley. Those two are not, uh, those two are not incompatible in any way. So those are very, very real experiences, uh, and they have to be studied by consciousness research. Uh, there's nothing that you can you can say reasonably about heaven or hell coming from physics or coming from biology or coming from. Uh, from medicine because we are talking about states of states of mind.